Hello everyone. How are you? I hope you're doing well this Friday afternoon UK time. My name is Carl and I'm one of the tutors here at the TEFL Org. And every Friday we bring you a webinar around a certain topic, but they're live webinars. So if you have any questions at all you might have about teaching English as a foreign language, please put it in the chat and um, I will try and get around to answering them. Um, who am I? Well, as I said, I'm Carl. I'm one of the tutors here at the TEFL Org. I've worked as a TEFL teacher in many places around the world. I've worked in Vietnam, China, Sri Lanka, Japan, Kazakhstan. Um, where else have I worked? Uh, Azerbaijan. Pre-COVID, I worked a lot in Spain and Italy. Um, and through the last five or six years from my home here in Northern Ireland in my spare room, I have also worked as an online teacher and an online examiner. And obviously for the TEF Org, I work as a teacher trainer. So hopefully with that experience, I'll be able to answer any questions you might have. Please say hello to me in the chat. Let me know where you are. Um, Alejandra, hello. Semwanga, hello. And hello, please, any questions you have, please get them in. I'm going to do a, a little presentation, but once um, I finish the presentation, then I will get round, I promise, to all of the questions that you have. Um, also, Erin is monitoring the chat today. Alan is taking a good, well-deserved week off. So Erin is fantastic at putting in links, type into the answer, maybe type in an answer before I get in there. So fantastic okay so hello all the hellos are coming in avril hello in india maya on the isle of wight hello javier in malaga oh i wish i could be in malaga um rani hello morella hello and iris hello 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 so please put in all the chats so um erin i wonder if we could just yeah perfect thank you see erin's she's two steps ahead of me all the time um so TEFL as a non-native speaker is the theme of our webinar this Friday. Um, now, I want to start by saying some truths, something about non-native speakers and native speakers. OK, because I think we here at the TEFL Org, we're very honest in, in everything we do and just something, some things that I want to basically make people a bit aware of. OK, now, the first thing is, if you are a non-native speaker, then it is more difficult to find work than native speakers. I, I don't want to sort of pretend that, you know, everything's sort of even. This is a horrible situation. It's a bad situation, in my opinion. I don't think it should happen. But it is true that if you are a non-native speaker, then it is more difficult to find work. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in, in a bit, OK? Um, but I want to say straight off, it's not impossible to find work. I have trained many people who are a non-native speaker and they have gone abroad, they've worked in Asia, they've worked in various parts of Europe, some have even gone to South America, Central America. So it's definitely possible, others have taught online, I should say that as well, but um, it's definitely not impossible to find work, okay? Now, when I started 20 years ago, there was a sort of a shift away from native speakers being the best teachers. and it was sort of started in the decades before that. Um, unfortunately, though, in the 1900s, the late 1900s, there was a, a, a an observation which was completely wrong that made, said that native speakers made better teachers than non-native speakers. And all PhDs and all master's theses that you read about this subject since sort of the year 2000 have proven that this is not true. However, there are unfortunately still throwbacks to, to companies um, thinking that native speakers are better than non-native speakers. However, lots of companies nowadays, for example, the British Council, one of the biggest learning institutions in TEFL, uh, doesn't care about the nationality of, doesn't care about the nationality, doesn't care about the first language of their teachers. They care about the qualifications and that's the way it should be. And I believe that things are still improving more as we go along. What I would say is that in 2022, the passport you hold, whichever country it might be, is more of a barrier than your um, the, the way you speak in terms of your pronunciation or in terms of the sort of level of English or the ability you have as a teacher. It's the passport that you hold that can stop people getting work more than 
what your first language is if everybody's got a good level of qualifications and that kind of thing okay now so i have managed language schools in asia and in europe and i some of the best teachers that i have managed were non-native speakers i personally would have no problem at all with um taking on a non-native speaker who had a good qualification and had a, and did a nice interview that kind of thing I, and, and that's how it is going okay so just want to be truthful out there let, let you know that we know that it can be more difficult for non-native speakers but it doesn't have to be okay first thing i want to say and this is sort of maybe getting into a bit of a linguistics lecture which is not what i want if you've got any questions please put them in chat i can see them coming in i promise i'll get around to them what is a native speaker OK, it's not easy to make a definition about what a native speaker is. OK, you know, if you look on if you go into sort of linguistic websites, if you look in sort of linguistic dictionaries, there will be sort of dif def different definitions. Now, a very sort of broad one is that it's usually seen as someone who speaks a language from childhood. Doesn't mean it's so really sort of the first language, but. Obviously, some people have two languages. If you've got, for example, I, when I lived in Japan, lots of people had one Japanese parent and an, and an English, American, Australian parent. Bilingual, they were native speakers in both. OK, so it's usually someone who speaks a language from childhood tends to be the general definition of a native speaker. But recently it has evolved more into somebody who's might not have spoken English in their childhood but has developed into learning english and has something called a high cefr level now what is a cefr that's basically a grade of language and if you're a beginner of speaking any language you're something called a0 level and that goes all the way up to c1 and c2 level google it if you want more information but basically nowadays you might see jobs and they don't really care about the nativeness of english but more if you can prove that you've got a high level of english if you can prove you've got a high level of english through through taking the test then you'll be able to qualify for any jobs where there is a native speaker wanted okay but some companies will say it's the passport that you have that declares what whether you are a native speaker which is kind of crazy because there's plenty of people in the uk who have moved from another european country to the uk have now got themselves a british passport who might not have an, a c2 level of english and there's plenty of people that live abroad outside of the uk or america or australia or new zealand or ireland who have a, a c2 level of english but don't have that passport but that's what companies, some companies will say. OK. Some other companies say that if you've got a school or university qualification from an English speaking school, that classes you as a native speaker. So, for example, maybe your parents moved to the UK when you were 10, 11, 12. You then went through the UK school system for senior school. You came out with GCSEs, A levels, uh, which were all delivered in English. You might not have spoken it when you were five, six, seven, eight, year, nine years old, but you come through the school system, you've got these qualifications that counts as a native speaker. So I'm hoping to show you through this that it's not easy to define what a native speaker is. And don't just if you are watching this and you think I'm a non native speaker, maybe you are a native speaker. You just don't really know. And you sort of see the adverts and you think, oh, that can't be me. But actually, it could be you. All right. So to sort of take this on a little bit further now, if I was a non-native speaker and I saw a job I really wanted to do in a place where I really wanted to go, teaching the sort of things that I really want to do, what I would do is ask the company advertising if I qualify as a native speaker. Because if you've got high if you've got a high level IELTS qualification, fantastic that might that might class you as a native speaker you might have a undergraduate or a master's degree from a british university maybe that will class you as a native speaker 
ask. You, there's, you've got nothing. That, if you think that that job, you could do that job, you've got good qualifications, good TEFL qualifications, then go for it. Ask the companies. All right. If you see a job that you want, email them, as I just said, find out and email them. Okay. And also research if there are other non-native speakers working there. Okay. So look on Facebook, look on Reddit, look on YouTube, look on Google, put the name of the company in and look for, I don't know, uh, testimonials, look for uh, blog posts, this kind of thing, look for comments, see who is the sort of person that works there because you might actually be able to work there. Okay. If you believe you have a native level of English, but you are flashing a Polish passport or you're showing a Indian passport, okay, but you believe you have a native level of English, have you got a way of proving it? It's, it's, it's kind of important and it can definitely help you if you could go and do an IELTS test, get a high level, go and do a Cambridge test, get a high level, go do a Trinity or a TOEFL test, get a high level, okay? Think about that because if you can prove it, then you might be able to go for these jobs where they want native speakers. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I can see all the hellos coming in. A lot of people in, talking in from Poland as well and some Slovenians. Okay, lovely. Bulgaria, France, fantastic. Definitely going to get to any questions you might have. And if you disagree or agree with any of this, I can't even point properly, please, please put it in the chat. Okay, please, please, please. I'm going to get to those questions in a second. So the first thing I want to talk about really here is, is working abroad. Okay. And um, what I would say is if you are a non-native speaker, or even if you're a native speaker, because as I said before, it's not easy to say what a native or non-native speaker is. What happens is that the visa requirements differ for each country. So there is something, I think it's called the big seven, where it tends to be that a lot of countries abroad want people who have a British, an Irish, an Australian, a New Zealand, um, an American, a Canadian, and sometimes a South African passport. Okay, that's tends to be what, like, for example, China often sort of goes down this route where they only want, they don't really care about people's um, first language. They sort of care about the passport that they have. So visa requirements do change country to country. And I'm going to talk a little bit in a minute about some different countries. OK, situations change a lot in terms of the visas and the passports that are accepted, the requirements to get into a country. So what might be true in 2022, if you're watching this video in 2023, might not be true. China might have changed who they're allowing in. They just they did something. They changed something last year. Um, uh, Japan might change it. Okay. The requirements. So situations change a lot and they're still changing now. And COVID is changing it even more. Okay. Where could be next month. Honestly, it could be next month that, um, Japan starts letting in people with an Indian passport, for example, starts letting in people with a Polish passport could easily happen. It could still change. And COVID has really thrown everything up in the air for that. Okay. So if I was a non-native speaker, who doesn't basically have a passport from the UK or America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, like I just said. These are some of the countries that I would be looking at if you wanted to go work abroad. OK, the first ones in Southeast Asia are Thailand, Cambodia and Vietnam. Now, I've grouped them together because they're geographically close to each other, but the requirements they have are quite different. Out of those three, I would say Cambodia is one of the easiest to get in, especially if you uh, if you don't have a degree. Thailand's probably the next easiest in terms of the requirements and Vietnam's probably the most difficult of those three. Now, we have posts on our blog pages. So if you go to tefl.org slash blog, B-L-O-G, you can and put in their non-native speakers. We've got some posts where it goes into a lot of detail about these three countries. OK, but those are three that I'd be looking at if I wanted to go abroad as a non-native speaker. Other ones, which ones you probably haven't thought about. I worked in Kazakhstan. I visited Mongolia as a tourist. Um, they will take people on, pay people in to go work there. 
okay? Kazakhstan's pretty well paid usually. Um, Mongolia, totally out there, very different. Couple of countries you might not have thought about that you can go out there and work, okay? Now, I'm saying Japan, however, Japan does have a whole longer list of things that someone's got to have in order to get in there. And it could be that you don't have a passport from one of those countries I just mentioned, but you do have an, a degree from an English speaking university. Have a look and if you do qualify to go to Japan on your passport. OK, again, our blog page has a lot more things about this. OK. Central and South America. I especially think in Costa Rica and Colombia are two that are definitely quite open at the moment to taking people in. There are obviously other countries in South and Central America. And I mean, there's also a lot of COVID down there at the moment, which means that a lot of them are sort of closed again, not taking people in. But there are countries down there who will take people on as a non-native speaker. But and this is actually the same for native speakers as well. They very often, like Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, want people to already be there in order to get the work. They don't tend to, they do sometimes, but they don't tend to advertise abroad for people to fly in and work there. But they definitely do take people on who are already out there. Costa Rica, Colombia is different. They sometimes pay your flights, they sometimes pay your accommodation, all that kind of thing. But most of Central and South America will take on native speakers, non-native speakers, but you have to maybe already be there. And there are others as well on this list. OK, but what what I don't want to go into loads of detail about all of them, but definitely I can see Erin's put some blogs in there, some uh, links in there for us. Have a look at those. OK. The other thing to think about is working within the EU if you have an EU passport. Spain, Italy, especially, but also to a certain extent, um, of the Eastern European countries or um, uh, parts of France, for example, Portugal as well. They will take on people with um, if, you, if you've got a good TEFL qualification, they will take people on to come and work for them in Spain and Italy. I've worked in many places in Spain and Italy where they struggle to recruit teachers. So that might be something to think about if you do already have an EU passport. If you're coming from outside the EU into the EU, it's difficult. Brexit has affected um, British people going to work there as well. It has lifted the requirements quite a bit. So outside the EU going into the EU is difficult. But if you're already within the EU, think about maybe moving to Spain or Italy to teach. Um, obviously, that was moving abroad, but let's talk about teaching online. And there are many companies that take on non-native speakers. There are. OK, again, our blog post we we have about this where we list the companies, tell you things, sort of the the um, uh, the wages, that kind of thing and who you might be teaching. There are many, many companies. And again, if you see a job that you like and you want to know if you would qualify about it, Email them, ask them. OK. If you're going to teach online, if you think that teaching online is the best thing for you, then definitely setting up on your own is the best long term. So this is something I do. I have my own web page. I have my own Facebook page, blah, blah, blah. I, I create my own bookings to myself through students. OK. Setting up on your own is definitely the best long term. And if you want to go and teach online, you definitely think this, I would really recommend if you feel like you need to do extra modules on top of the basic 120 hour qualification. The reason why I'm saying this is if you if you go for a job and you're a non native speaker and then somebody is a native speaker and you've both got the same level of qualifications, the company is probably very wrongly going to give it to a native speaker if you've both gone for the same. But what I would suggest if you've then got an extra qualification, then they might, the, pardon me, the company might take you on instead of that native speaker. Definitely having qualification, definitely having some practical experience, such as one of our practical courses would definitely help you out there. Okay. 
If you are a non-native speaker, take your time and practice the application videos. Okay, I mean, I would suggest this to native speakers, but I think it's important for non-native speakers that you practice your video. Don't just think, oh, that'll do when you have to make a little video talking about yourself or when you have to do sort of a trial lesson, whatever it is the company's asking you to do. Take your time and listen carefully and honestly to your accent, okay? Are you speaking too quickly? Are you sometimes saying a particular sound wrong? Because a company is might be quite quick to pe pick people up on this. So look carefully at your accent, okay? Thank you for all the questions. Um, there's it doesn't these questions today don't have to be about native speaker non native speaker and I can see that some other people have put other questions in there. Fantastic. Couple more slides and then I'm with you. Okay. How to stand out from the crowd then? If you've got a good quality TEFL qualification, what do I mean by a good quality one? I mean one that has been accredited by other companies. So for example, our TEFL qualifications, we are checked by an accrediting company. They come and check me, they come and check the materials we give you, they come and check like the standard of assignments to check that it's good quality. We can then stamp our the company's accreditation on our certificates. It's really important that if you go for a TEFL qualification, you check the accreditation of the companies that you're going to give the money to check that they are getting themselves looked at by other companies to make sure that you have a high quality. Why is that important? Because the companies that you go and work for will check that. They want to know that you have been taught by a good quality training scheme. If you're a non-native speaker and you've got a cheap TEFL qualification that is not accredited, you're much less likely to find work. Okay. Look about doing some extra modules suited for the type of job that you want. So if you're going to go teach online, do a practical course where you spend a weekend with someone like me, where I help you to learn how to teach online and I show you how to do it. And then you actually deliver a lesson where you teach online. Okay. If you know you if you if you know you're going to go work abroad, you're not going to go online, but you know you want to teach kids, do an extra module in not young learners. Business English, the same. Think about what you want to do, because, as I said, if you're there with the same level of qualifications as a native speaker, if you can stand out a bit, fantastic. OK, on your applications, check your grammar, then get someone else to recheck your grammar. OK, um, this is important because. When I've been recruiting teachers, I have it's, it's native speakers as, as well as non native speakers, but a lot of applications come into me with bad grammar. And obviously, this is a job where you need to have good grammar. And you might check it and think that's fine. But if this is an error that you don't see or an error that you often do and you don't really know about it, you're not going to see it when you check it. If you get a friend, if you get a teacher, someone to recheck it for you. If you've done one of our courses, contact us. We can help you. Then get someone to recheck it. OK. Get experience. Companies, recruiters love experience, either face to face or online. Can you volunteer? Is there some organization near you? If you're in an English speaking country, then there will be churches, there will be charities that will cry out for English teachers. If you want to work online or you're not in the UK or Australia, wherever it might be, then look at a company such as RefuNet if you believe you've got a good English. Refu.net, okay? Volunteer and that kind of thing. Start some, you know, look on Facebook groups. Start, say, look, I'm willing to give some, some free lessons. That can go on your CV just to show that you've gone out there. Could you teach your friends who maybe have a less English level than you? You might not need to charge them. You might charge them a small amount. Look locally to get experience. There will be people near you wanting to learn English. Use your own experience as a non-native speaker as a tool. What would a great teacher do? So you have probably sat in classes learning English 
where there was terrible teachers. Mold yourself to not be like them. Look at the latest methods that we would teach you here at the TEFL org and show that on your CV. This is how I'm going to do this. Show that in your experience. People like me, I never learned another language. OK, so, well, when I was at school and I didn't learn another language when I was at school. See, my grammar's gone then. Um, I couldn't really know about what was a good teacher or was a bad teacher until I started doing my qualifications myself. OK. And lastly, prove your English ability. Show them that you've show the people that you're applying for that you have got C1 level, C2 level, B2 level, whatever it might be. Show them that you are trusted to, to give a good level of English to your students. OK, some of my final thoughts, then I'm going to get to these lovely questions that are coming in. Now, in my experience of doing this job, a lot of non-native speakers give up easily from finding work. They do the qualification and they haven't got a job within a month, even though they've been applying to loads and they've, well, that's it. They're not going to not people aren't going to um, take me on because I'm not a native speaker. I know native speakers that take two, three months to get get work. OK, might be that the time when you finish your qualification is not a good recruiting time. Lots of companies want want people to start in October or March or um, January, so October, January, March. If to work in the UK, a lot of the jobs are in July, August. So just keep going, okay? Keep going. Don't give up too easy. Don't get disheartened if you're seeing lots of jobs, native speaker, native speaker, native speaker, because as I said, you might qualify for them, okay? Um, uh, don't under or overestimate your English ability. Lots of people say to me, oh, I mean, I've got native level and I can see from the, the messages they send me and the emails they send me that they don't. I also know non-native speakers that say, oh, my English isn't good enough to apply for those jobs when actually it is. Don't under or overestimate your English ability. OK. Um, you might need to start doing a job a level or an age you don't want to do. So when I qualified, I was like, oh, I don't want to teach kids. Absolutely not. I want to teach adults. I found out that I actually quite enjoy teaching kids and I don't nowadays teach kids. I do exams for kids, but I don't teach kids. And do you know what? I do miss it. Don't pigeonhole yourself in what I'm only going to teach advanced levels. I'm only going to teach adults and I'm only going to teach business English. No, because be open to anything to get your foot in the door. OK, um, get a good qualification. I can't swear that uh, enough. Just get get a good qualification and finally just be patient. Work will come for you as a non-native speaker. And if you're watching this as a native speaker, you will get work at the moment. Covid has still two years, whatever it is, changing everything. Definitely you will find work if you're patient. Right, let's get to some of those questions. I hope you enjoyed that presentation. I didn't babble on too much. Um, please let me know if you didn't enjoy it. <laughs> or also let me know if you did enjoy it. Um, right, hello everybody. Hello, 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 hello. Priya, I hope you're still there. I hope you're uh, th three minutes past four. So that was about 20 odd minutes ago. I hope you're still there. If not, you can always watch this again. Uh, Priya's question was, how do I get an online job as a TEFL educator? Is there any platform? Right. Um, so there's we, I've done videos specifically where I go into a lot more detail about teaching online, Priya. I'd, I'd look up those on our YouTube or our Facebook page or I see you on LinkedIn, maybe on LinkedIn they're there as well. Right. Three different ways to become an online teacher. Basically, you can um, work for yourself long term best way to do it. You can work for a company or you could do a bit of both of those. You work for a company and you set yourself up online. I would recommend you do the third one. You go work for a company, you go get your TEFL qualification, you go to somewhere like our job page um, and you find work on there. OK, you you'll see companies that are advertising and you basically got your TEFL qualification in your hand, you apply to them. Is that what you mean by platform? I think it is, Priya. 
if you know there's not one single way there's lots of companies lots of different companies advertising for people find one you like work for them okay um i hope that answered your question priya um iris hello you're a slovene national but you have quite often been asked to prove that i am not a brit as people hear you speak so is that you saying that you've got a great accent a brilliant iris i think that that sounds like a good thing is it yes i think it is isn't it yes good well done for you iris you, you you've obviously got fantastic pronunciation well done um jacqueline so you started learning and speaking english when you were in grade one our schools use english as that language of instruction can i consider myself native i would say yes jacqueline that to me i would take people on as a native speaker but if I would email the companies of any jobs you want and say, look, this is me, this is what I've done, check your punctuation, Jacqueline, okay? And I would apply to them and say, look, this is me, do I count as a native speaker? What's the worst that they can say? I'm sorry, no. Okay, fine, you've just spent an email, but if they say, oh yes, actually, that's fantastic, that, that's perfect for us. Perfect, then go for it, hey, Jacqueline? Definitely. Shu, hello Shu, uh, Shu Singh, um, can we have some company names you can offer non-natives a job? You have a doctorate in English with 10 years experience. Well, you, I would say you're a native Shu. Uh, even online jobs, you're from India. Well, yeah, in one of our links that Erin's put, I think after you put this question, we have some companies there that apply for them, okay? Shu, I would be set in my set with that much English, with that much that fantastic qualification i would be setting myself up as an independent online teacher for sure okay 100 percent. i would i think that um you would definitely be able to find work there teaching academic english teaching uh you know qu uh, the qualifications ielts something like that i think definitely you could definitely do that shoe um sure if you've got a tefl qualification with us um send us a message we might be able to help you if you really are struggling okay um renata hello if i have a master's in english language from polish university will it count as a native speaker uh right it's a good question renata very often they want recruiters companies want people who have it from an, a university based in an English speaking country. However, if that master's was 100% delivered in English and there was no Polish being spoken in the year or two years you did it, then it might count as a native speaker. Again, Renata, I can't speak generally for all companies. What I would suggest is you email the companies and you find out if they would take that as a native speaker i would probably take that as a native speaker okay especially if you can also prove it with an ielts or something like that renata good luck um alejandro alejandra sorry alejandra hello you're from mexico with eight years of experience brilliant you studied in the us but didn't finish does it count have you got any qualifications alejandra to show that you did this might count might count if you study the new i don't know how long you study the new s4 need a bit more information alejandra tell me more um james hi how about online teaching for non-native speakers which countries regions so right really james it, it's not really talking about countries and regions so the biggest market is east asia China, Japan, South Korea. However, they do take on non-natives. It's really about just finding a company advertising at the time. Now they could be teaching Latin Americans. They could be teaching Europeans. They could be teaching Asians. It doesn't really matter. What you're looking at is a company that's advertising basically. So go on one of our job center pages. So if you go to tefl.org, you look at jobs at the top, see a company advertising, go for it. Um, go on eslcafe.com, 
see companies advertising, you think you hit the requirements, go for it. Go on tefl.com, look for online jobs on there. You hit the requirements, go for it, James. I don't really think I need to say you should go teach Chinese, you should go teach Vietnamese, you should go teach Brazilians. No, you should go with where the jobs are, James. Uh, Morella, when you talk about having a degree, do you mean a degree in teaching or in any degree? I have do not have a degree in teaching. I have a degree in language and linguistics, but it doesn't have to be a teaching degree. A three year or four year, depending on the country, degree is fine and could be in anything. Could be in history, could be in geography, can be in mathematics. Doesn't matter. Just got to have those letters after your name, B-A or B-S-C, whatever it might be, Morella. Okay. Um, hello, all the hellos. So nice to say, everyone. Thank you very much for putting in hellos. Alan, an unrelated question. I like unrelated questions. You're starting freelance work at a VHS in Germany in March. Anywhere I can find info about freelance work, what medical insurance is needed, etc. Ooh. Uh, right. Good question. Um... So really, you're sort of wanting to know about the tax situation, I'm guessing there, and sort of how to set yourself up legally to do it. Alan, is that right? Uh, every country is different. That doesn't help you, does it? Uh, I would, first of all, see if there's any help for... Uh, well, I would, I'd first of all look up like the German tax office website and look up the German insurance there must be websites by the german government to help you with this sort of stuff there must be the even i mean the british government has them for people so german government definitely will much more efficient than we are um medical insurance well, i i don't know i i when i lived in japan i didn't have medical insurance as a freelancer companies tend to sort out your medical insurance as a freelancer i don't know I'm really not helping you, Alan, but I don't know the answer is, is the truth about working in Germany as a freelancer. I'm sorry. If anyone can help Alan out, please say. Uh, hello, 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 hello. Gambits. Definitely. You don't understand why this is a thing. Neither do I. My wife did her master's in EFL and she did her master's on this because she was so annoyed about it. Um, obviously, she proved that non-native speakers are just as good as native speakers in fact better don't tell the world but better i'll whisper that into the microphone better sometimes better um why are they employees because because there was some papers written in the 60s and 70s which tried to think that this was true and they did some disproven research that shows it should they said showed it was true it's not true and unfortunately, it sort of still stayed with it. Now, nowadays, a lot of it comes from the passports because it's just com countries are more willing, wrongly, to give uh, work to people with a British, American, Australian, blah, 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 passport. OK, so it sort of continues down that route. <laughs> and unfortunately, there are parents out there who still believe that this is the right way because they were sort of taught 20 30 years ago by native speakers it's changing gambits it's changing okay iris i missed your question i'm terrible i'm sorry um how difficult would it be for me to find a job in an eu country i hold a degree in english language i've been teaching english foreign language in slovenia i don't think it would be very difficult at all iris right so what i would do if i was you would be to look at where you want to work in Spain. Don't maybe go for Barcelona or Madrid. Look beyond those places. Look at Malaga, Valencia, um, Cadiz. Look at um, Almeria. Beautiful cities that I've just... Bilbao off the top of my head, you know. Look at... I'd go on Google. I would find schools that are there. And I would do it on Google Maps and I would contact them and say, hello, this is me. This is what I have. If I come to your city on a cheap Ryanair stroke EasyJet flight, will I be able to find work? And they will hopefully say yes. If they don't, look at another school. OK, 
A lot of British people have had to leave Spain and Portugal. So there's a big market now for non-British people to go and work in Spain and Portugal. That's what I would do. You would find you'll find work, Iris. OK, you will. Uh, Shu, thank you for that information. Um, not sure what I can do with that. Uh, oh, Alejandro, you have you studied for two and a half years in a community college. Yeah, you're the guy that the, the sorry, the person that went into study in America and you have your original transcripts. Might count. Two and a half years isn't a huge amount of time, Alejandro. I'll be honest with you, um, but might count. Email the company, see if that works. Um, sorry, I'm just going to have a quick drink here. My throat's going. Uh, our Bond year. Hello. Is that like James Bond? Uh, you have some teaching experience and you've just got your TEFL certificate. You're also a life coach. I need you, Mr. Bond. Uh, could I combine these qualifications and find clients online? If yes, where? Whoa, Mick. Hello, Mick. Sorry, I should have gone with Mick before I read Mr. Bond year. Um, yes imagine now i don't think i know an online teacher who does life coaching and efl that's an amazing niche that i reckon people will pay a lot of money for how would you find the client first of all you've got to learn a bit of marketing i'm just wondering myself if i should become a life coach although i think you need to have a good life in order to be a life coach um how would you find the clients you would understand some basic marketing you would build a website you will start facebook social media instagram talk tick uh click clock whatever it's called and instagram uh is that still a thing with the kids i don't know and you funnel them through to your website you say how great you are mick and you get them to pay takes time but definitely you'll be able to find them through marketing yourself correctly definitely that's an interesting one uh Avril, uh, you're from India. Hello. The whole of my education been in English based institutions. Well done. Would I be able to get a job in Japan, Egypt or Russia? <whistles> Russia is one of the I should have put Russia on the list. I think Russia is one of the better places to find work. Yeah, definitely. I reckon you might be able to get a bit of work in Russia. I always forget Russia and I had a great time in Russia. I don't know why I keep forgetting to put Russia. Egypt, I've got no idea how it is to get what the visa requirements are for Egypt. Japan, yes, if you then hit all of the requirements that Japan has, and they have loads. Japan loves a bit of admin. So uh, go on our website, Avril, and look up one of the links that Erin put in the chat for me, and uh, you'll see exactly what you need to go and study in Japan. I reckon you've got a good chance there, definitely. Russia, amazing, yeah bit cold compared to India I think well no some parts of India are cold uh good luck Avril definitely I think you'll be able to find work Amy hello is it easy for US passport holders to get a job teaching in the UK and France uh it costs money because you have to find the right basically to go to Europe and the UK we have certain requirements which tends to be like an appoints based to come in so what let are you do you have a qualification in a subject that we want people in so for example i know that there's a shortage of chefs in the uk so if you've got a chef qualification much more likely to get you get more points for that compared to someone that might have a qualification in geography for example um then they do it on your age and you keep racking up these points to check you've got enough. And then at the end of all that, there's a load of money you've probably got to pay, Avril. OK. Um, France is a similar situation. I know Americans that do go work in Europe for sure, but they tend to have a European Union spouse or a great grandma that was European Union that gets them in. Okay. It's not impossible, Amy, but it might cost you a few quid. Okay. Um, good luck with it, though. Don't be put off. But don't let me be too negative there, Amy. There's, it's definitely a way. Okay. Hanny, uh, you used to have an American accent, but since moving to the UK, your accent is between both. Can you change it, Hanny? That would be amazing. Um just changing it will from hi how are you doing to all right mate i'm from london 
Um, right, okay. Oh, sorry, you got another question. Would the accent be a problem? I don't think so. There are companies out there that wrongly want people with American accents. So that would exclude me from working for them. Okay. I don't think so. Okay. Hello, Dr. Phil. Good to see you. He tunes in every week. Not the Dr. Phil from America, a different Dr. Phil. Um, uh, Nina, Samantha from France. Oh, oh no. Okay. Oh, 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 hello, Samantha. You are Samantha from France. You're not talking to Samantha from France. Where can you read my wife's or other such research papers? My, I don't think my missus's master's thesis is probably, pro, is probably put online, but it used to be that all master's theses in the UK were you could get a copy of them in the British Library. I'm not sure if that's true nowadays, but that used to be something that happened. Uh, other such research, but just I would go on um, Google Scholar. Yeah, I love Google Scholar. I can get lost in there for hours. Google.com slash Scholar. C-S-C-H-O-L-A-R. Helps if you can spell Scholar. Um, Good. Thank you, everybody. I think we're coming to the end now. If there's any more questions, please put them in. Um, no, I don't think there are. I think I think we've done all the questions, Aaron. So listen, everyone, thank you for joining us. If you are still there, if you've managed to spend the last 40 odd minutes with us, I just want to show you our website. Where I can just give you um, a bit more information if you if I've gone into things that you want more stuff about. So if you go to our website, tefl.org, look, we've got a sale on at the moment. Perfect time to get into TEFL if you do want to. Um, TEFL courses up here will give you loads of information about the different types of courses we do, including some of those extra modules that I was going on about. If you want to look at some jobs, we have a section there, TEFL jobs. Click on that. You can view all our jobs. We've got help there for CVs, that kind of thing. We've also got this section, which is my favorite part of the website, um, which is the blog section. Click on that. We have a search option here. You type in non-native speakers, for example. You do a search and we've got these recommended ones here, but tends to be down here. Latest posts that are most accurate. Can non-native English speakers teach TEFL? Yes. Teaching English online as a non-native speaker. Click on that. Click on that. You'll get more information. If you want to ask us a question, click down here and you can chat with us. There we go. Um, thank you, everybody, for still tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please like this video and please tell your friends about this video through sharing it on WhatsApp, um, Carrier Pigeon or email whatever people do okay um thank you very much uh hope you've enjoyed today please send us a message if you've got any more questions we are more than happy to help we are more than happy to get people into teaching english as a foreign language have a good weekend bye bye <laughs>